Hello there, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that really hurt. I just bashed my elbow on the table. For those of you wondering why Chris is swinging oh. his arms around in a podcast recording, you're right to wonder. How? That serves me right to not gesticulate on a podcast, given that no one can see me. Anyway, hello there, everybody. And I'm being very careful of my elbows. Thank you for joining us and welcome back to episode 24 of DBL, uh, the Redgate podcast that's all about data and beer. Uh, of course, my name is Chris. And my name is also Chris. Ooh. That never gets old. Oh, wait, it did about 23 episodes ago. Hey. <laughs> Unsurprising. We've done enough takes on it. I think, I think we keep it fresh. That was, that was a back to basics one, though. A very much back to basics and also definitely not scripted the elbow bash there because that's definitely going to come through in the recording. Yeah, unlike the rest of us, which is all completely scripted to the word. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> hypo. Anyway, uh, thank you all for joining us. I can't believe it's been 24 episodes. I remember when we turned 21 just a few months ago when we first went into lockdown, and now it seems like it's just flown by. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we've Fingers got... Fingers crossed that lockdown is over by episode 56. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Lockdown 12, where we actually help save the NHS. Uh, anyway, oh dear. that was my best, my best Boris impression there, anyway. It was almost as good as Matt Locus's. Oh, that was so good. For anyone listening, if you don't watch The Great British Bake Off, you should be watching The Great British Bake Off. It is a, it's on, I think it's on a, a few different streaming services uh, at the moment, but you can watch the older episodes. And then Matt Lucas, the English comedian, also did a, a really good impression of Boris Johnson. So if you care anything for UK politics, comedy, or cake, then check out The Great British Bake Off. Uh, we're not being paid. This isn't a sponsorship. I just really love cake. Wait, wait, wait. Um, Were we being paid for some of the other things? No one told me. I mean... I've, I've put it in a, a special trust fund for you for when you're grown up. <laughs> That'll be a long way up. I guess oh, the, yeah. and the big takeaway from that was, is it scone or scone? Uh, scone. I actually can't remember what I usually call it now. I'm going to say scone just to be different. No, fair anyway, yeah, anyway. British Bake Off is good, but, but back on topic. Why yes, here, back Chris? on topic. So today uh, we're actually going to be talking about a very cool piece of technology, uh, something really relatively new to the fray for you and I, but something that's been around for some time and is in use by many, many people when it comes to uh, database, well, change management effectively. Uh, and that, of course, is Flyway. Ooh. Ooh, come fly away with me. Oh, you stole my title. I did. Um, <laughs> oof. Uh, oh, it's so dark in here. Oh, my goodness. The sun <laughs> has disappeared. Anyway, no uh, the, no yes, yeah, so in this particular episode, we're going to be talking about Flyway or Flyway DB, as some people know it. And uh, we'll be taking you through the kind of who's, what's, where's and why's with Flyway, how to, how to work it, what it does, all of these sorts of good things. Uh, but of course, this wouldn't be an episode of DBL without the beer. And fortunately, uh, fortunately, this month has been well, this month has been pretty crazy. Do you know why? Um, I mean, other than everything that's happened, other than everything and the entire world being a mess. Yes, absolutely. Specifically, it's, what has happened, Chris? Specifically, we actually had two beer deliveries uh, this particular month. We have two. We, there are just people who want to send us beer. Can you believe that? <laughs> I don't know how we've managed to achieve this wonderful nirvana where people just send us alcohol. I think that's the, the pinnacle is, of everyone's uh, everyone's career. Exactly. And the thing is, you know. Uh, <laughs> We've been sent more beer than we can drink on an episode of DBL. So uh, I'll just be enjoying a nice, a nice cold one this evening and Speak recreating, yourself, recreating one of my favorite TikToks, which of course is 
Did somebody say Bevragino? Oh my god. I so can't if believe you're, that you've managed to shoehorn TikTok into a SQL Server podcast. If you it's not just SQL Server, as you will find out shortly. Uh, but fortunately, fortunately, uh, if uh, if you are out there and listening, and you do know what I'm referencing with, uh, did someone say Bev Ragino? Please tweet me at Plant Based Sequel. Did somebody say Bev Ragino? It would absolutely make my day, evening, month, week, year. 2020 would be so much better. I can 100% guarantee you that. That is like two people in that intersection of our podcast. I, I just want a string, a string of people saying, did at Plant Based Sequel say Bev Ragino? It would just be perfect. Anyway, uh, we have, yes, like I said, we've got two lots of beer that have been delivered. Uh, one from uh, actually a previous donator to DBL, uh, the good uh, Robert French, who is a wonderful and very... Um, like super intelligent, wonderful to follow on Twitter uh, person. But we're actually, uh, we have to apologize uh, to you, Bob, because uh, uh, as a second time donator, we've actually gone with uh, someone else for this particular episode. Don't worry, your beer is in safe hands and it will be drunk uh, or we will for episode 25. But this week we have donations from the wonderful Stephen Manson, who is a friend of Redgate. He's at Mans048 on Twitter. Go and follow him, please. He's wonderful. And he's donated, well, a box of beers. And in it is a uh, rather delectable selection. Um, so we had to pick a beer each for this particular uh, episode. And <clears throat> just to kick us off, I've got here a, uh, a West Derbyshire brewery, Mr. Chubb's Session Bitter. Uh, it's actually quite light considering the beers I normally drink. It's about 3.4% uh, ABV. And yeah, it's brewed in the West, uh, West Berkshire Brewery. Oh, I, what did I say? West Derbyshire, West Bar <laughs> I'm so sorry, <laughs> breweries. This is West Berkshire Brewery. Uh, this is already drunk the other beers in the box. But... <laughs> apparently, the taste is supposed to be of lemon, toffee, and biscuit with a smell of malt, spicy hops, and floral. So that that'll is be a an fun interesting combination. One. So I'm going to open that in just a second. But Chris, why don't you tell us what you've got? Well, I know very little about what I've got. All I know <laughs> is that this is from uh, someone called John. It is a home brew. It is a single malt and hop. I'm very, very nervous, but also very excited about opening this. It has no label. So That's I'm, a good I'm literally sign. looking at a bottle with a yellow bottle cap at, that has some liquid in it. I don't even know what color it is because it's in a brown bottle. It, it, like, it, it's fairly light. Who knows? This could be incredibly strong as well. Well, John, uh, friend of Stephen, Guess what? You're about to have your single molten hop drunk live. I say live <laughs> on a recorded podcast where it's, it's going to be drunk. And so is Chris. So are you ready, Chris? I am ready. Are you ready? Fabulous. Here we go. I am. Hang on. Count down. Three, two, one. Oh, that, that was miraculously quiet. Oh, oh, oh yours is excitable. Always. For anyone who can't, well, for everyone who can't see what just happened to Chris Kurzweil, um, unfortunately, his beer just um, spilled over, was a little excitable. It's a very good Gosh. job that I'm not recording on my uh, home office where I work daily. That would be very bad if I got all this beer all over my notes. Oh, that's a good sound. Oh gosh, it's a big bottle. Oh, it's a pint. <laughs> oh my goodness. That, look at the color on that. It is brown. Absolutely beautiful. It's, so the Mr. Chubbs has this very copper complexion. It's, um, yeah, it holds up really nicely. Beautiful, beautiful head at the top of the glass as well. That's interesting. Interesting good. 
it is it is bitter, but at the same time, where it said it's got notes of toffee, I think I'm getting that. Really? And definitely like a biscuity aftertaste, yeah. Uh, I've been craving a biscuit all day ever since my wife said, oh, I could really go with a biscuit with my tea. And now I've, always, now I've just wanted a biscuit. And now I'm getting that kind of almost like a crummy kind of biscuity aftertaste. Uh, biscuit, by the way, for non-UK based people, I'm talking about cookies. Uh, in the UK, we refer to, to cookies as biscuits. Um, and big biscuits are cookies. Yeah, not something you'd have with gravy for sure. No, that's a dumpling, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, How's your homebrew? So this is a very interesting color. This is like a straw, pale yellow. It's like a really hazy... Very hazy. Very hazy. Um, smells like beer. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> it's, it was quite vigorous when I opened it, as, as Chris described. Let, let's have a taste. Well, it did make it through the UK postal system somehow. I really don't know what to expect, but that was really good. Quite like that. It's there you go, this. the expert's opinion right there. Yeah. Oh, didn't know what to expect, but that's, that's good. I like that. You'll find him in the next campaign for Real Ale Beer Guide. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Chris Carswell, guest speaker. So it's definitely a lot more sparkling than the uh, drinks I think we're used to drinking on this. Mm. But it's, uh, no, it's really quite good. It's quite refreshing. It's not got the strongest of flavor, but it, yeah, it, no, it, this could go down very easily. I'm kind of envious now. I feel like uh, I feel like we need to chat John up a bit and um, <laughs> try and try and bagsy ourselves a crate for the right price. Yeah, but no, it's uh, I guess it's it's more akin to like a cloudy or hazy lager. Maybe is the best way to think about it. Really? Mm. Hmm. It looks delicious, but yeah. um, I'm going to stick here with my Mr. Chubbs just because I enjoy saying Mr. Chubbs. <laughs> I feel like that would be my DJ name if I was going to be a DJ. Uh, next up on the mic, we've got Mr. Chubbs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what, whatever that, that music them kids listen to today. <laughs> them kids and their noise. Anyway, so now we've got our beer, Chris. We do. It's about time we got down to, uh, to brass tacks. It's you about know, time we got, oh dear. That phrase, get yeah. down to brass tacks. Most people assume that is tax spelt T A X. It's not. It's well, I tax. imagine it's tax as in like like little nails. It is, yeah. Why anyway. is it though? Like, I don't get the what's the etymology of the phrase. No, I've no idea. I just know that one little snippet about it. If you know what the etymology of the phrase "down to brass tax is, that I'm not going to Google again. Let us know. <laughs> I wonder if it's to do with shoes. I feel like it's if you, if you if you rip something apart, then you take it down to its very bare, like minimum materials. It the things holding it together. If only there was some kind of device we could use to look this up. Unfortunately, hang on. Let me just let me just see what what my phone says. Uh, oh, I see. I was going to ask my phone if there was a device that could look things up for us. No, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Anyway. Right. So today we're talking about Flyway or Flyway DB. Um, so, Chris, what is Flyway? What is Flyway? There's a lot of different ways to answer that, I guess. Okay. So you've got let's say you've got no more, you're running past someone, okay, you know, you're late for work, you're both running for the bus, and that person turns to you and they say, huh, huh, do you think we'll make it? And you say, yeah, we're only about a minute away. And then they say, Chris, what's flyway? I would say, you've got to tell them before you get to the bus. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> stop breathing into the mic. Uh, so flyway is, it's basically a framework that allows you to deliver database change scripts to testing and production environments, or developer environments, I guess, as well. Uh, hmm. That's the best way I think about it. 
it's also so it's built in um, built using the JDBC driver. Uh, mm -hmm. That's another kind of key facet to it, and it is also this is probably my favorite thing about it. Incredibly simple. Well, this is the thing. I feel like, um, so I recently did uh, Redgate Streamed, as you know. Mm -hmm. And as part of Redgate Streamed, uh, we had a session on Flyway, actually, with, um, it was myself and Grant Fritchie, or it was supposed to be myself and Grant Fritchie. Uh, but actually, it ended up being myself, Grant Fritchie, Steve Jones, Kathy Kellenberger, because our party got crashed for some reason. <laughs> we all ended up talking about it and something that came out that i thought was interesting was the fact that flyway is very very simple but like onions or like ogres uh whichever you prefer it has layers yes and that's I mean, what it is it's in, in its most basic form flyway is a command line executable that requires no install that connects to a target database using a JDBC driver and it executes and tracks migrations to evolve the version of the database. And it's got no frills. It doesn't generate the SQL, um, SQL scripts for you to migrate. But evolve it, the version of the database. That is one hell of a line. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't do anything fancy in the sense it doesn't generate the migrations for you because that's just way too much hassle. But the point is, it does give you that robust framework that people need to deliver their SQL migrations as a team to ultimately a target. And it's very developer focused. Um, but naturally there are a few, um, shall we say feathers in flyways cap get it flyway feathers cap um oh, you're welcome terrible. really terrible but there yeah. are a few feathers in this cap so um does it only support sql server for instance we, we spend a lot of time talking about sql server is it just sql server no so the that's the point of using jdbc right but suddenly you unlock basically the capability to run the the framework that we are used to at Redgate for other locations and other environments. Mm. We can run database change management on a Snowflake platform, which is kind of mad, right? Like Snowflake hasn't been around that long. No, it hasn't, but, um, but we've certainly seen an awful lot of interest in it. And we should point out, again, it's not just SQL Server and Snowflake, but because it's predominantly using a JDBC driver for these various different database platforms, like Flyway supports just well in advance of, I think, 20 relational database platforms. And that's for kind of BI-centric uh, platforms like Snowflake, but also for environments like SAP HANA or uh, is it Thunderbird or Firebird? One of them, Firebird, I think. Um, IBM DB2, um, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, MySQL, blah, all of them, basically. And if you think of a database, that. Yeah, and that's just the, the officially supported list. Like the, the whole point is by using JDPC, you can basically build your own integrations out, which given that it's open source, means that people do that. And that's where a lot of those kind of integrations come from. And it should be reasonably straightforward because you take the JDBC driver. As long as the JDBC driver supports the connection, you configure the driver to work with Flyway. And then you're simply taking SQL code and running it through Flyway against those target environments. And it's not just SQL code though, is it? Like, I mean, we're not just sat here saying, yeah, it's a command line tool and you can run SQL scripts. You know, I feel like we haven't fleshed it out enough. You do have a choice. Uh, you have the option of writing your migrations in SQL, the flavor that's required for your database of choice. Um, and also you could write your migrations in Java as well. Um, people are unsurprised by this, given that we're leveraging the JDBC here, but <laughs> you can write migrations in Java as well. And that's quite nice because it means that you can also plug this database evolution process into your java builds you could build it into a, a, a maven or a gradle project there are plugins for those so 
you know, it, the sky is the limit, really. It has a full Java um, API that you can leverage. You can build it in. You can use it standalone. Flyway is just this super simple but incredibly flexible cross-relational database um, you know, management tool for, like I said, the evolution of the schema. It's very, very cool. We, uh, yeah, I think Java as well. It, there's a lot of people who are very comfortable using Java. It's really handy. Something mm. I didn't know, actually, this is something I very recently learned, but I don't know. I, I guess when I thought of the big languages, I didn't really think Java was one of them, but I saw recently a snapshot of um, the of GitHub code repository is what languages were written in there. Can mm. you guess what the number one was? Python or Go? Oh, you're tantalizingly close in that you've given me number two and three. <laughs> uh, JavaScript? JavaScript is number one, yeah. Okay. So number four or five was Java, and it actually beat out um, C Sharp and C++ and wow. just standard C, which, yeah, I don't know, maybe says something more about the demographics of the, the people who use GitHub, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, Java is still a very strong platform, especially with Oracle developers. There's a there's a, a lot of cross correlation there. Yeah, I to and use the cross contamination, but that was probably the wrong phrase. <laughs> well, you know, the interesting thing is, as long as you've got you know the the runtime environment to run Java, and pretty much everything does, right? Everything can run Java. That's that's pretty much what it's intended to do is to just be completely portable so um you know you've got most devices in the world that can run java and the interesting thing of course is that again on this show we talk a lot about uh the use of um uh, we, we talk about microsoft technologies an awful lot we talk about sql server we talk about windows um, those common things. But again, that's another good thing about Flyway is that Flyway can run in Windows. It can run on Linux. It can run on uh, Android or iOS. It can run, gosh, it, it runs in a container. If you want to use the Flyway Docker container as part of a build process in Azure DevOps, you absolutely can. Uh, you know, just go to the Docker regis registry and you'll find it right there along with helpful usage instructions. There is just so many places and so many targets. Flyway can literally help you do anything. It's, um, it's really nice as well. If you think about, we have a huge team of developers at my company, let's say, and they work on all these various different data platforms. How do we make sure that they're all working in a unified way or in a similar way. How do we, what can we do around that? And so Flyway really offers, offers us the ability to start talking about those conversations. How do we take development teams, structure the way they work with databases? This is how uh, you, you place your code in a way that can be source controlled. This is how you can start leveraging so kind of CI, CD, use infrastructure as code around delivery code changes for all of your database platforms, basically. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting stuff. One thing I really like about it as well, because it's something that you can, so it's very light, the code base. Mm. It's not a huge download, but you can actually put it in source control alongside your code because naturally people would do that. If you are taking an open source project and building on top of that, of course you would. But that means that if you want to say run a build of it, you don't need to install it on the build server itself. You just download the, the whole package, then run the code itself from mm. the source control platform. Um, yeah. And that's just really handy. It is really handy. And I think, <clears throat> I think there's something that we should really think of, um, you know, when using Flyway is that yes, there are a huge load of command line switches that we can pass to the tool. And yes, you know, it does have, specific syntax and locations and you've got you know if you think about the actual flyway uh, zip file that comes down and i'm going to talk about the windows here because that's where i've used it yeah. but when you unzip the flyway uh, folder structure you've got effectively the locations for your jdbc drivers you've got 
your Java migrations, your SQL migrations, and then the config file. And this config file is super powerful. Like it's a super, super cool um, piece of, it's just, it's about a 300, 400 line document and you can tweak and uh, you can choose the exact behaviors of Flyway. So you can choose what developers have, you can have config files for later environments, you can pass environment variables to Flyway. It, it does everything and it just allows you to run migrations. But we talked a lot about where you can put it, how you can build it, how you can deploy these migrations. There's two things that we haven't really talked about though, and that's number one, what kind of migrations can Flyway run? So, uh, and, and what are the main commands in Flyway? So Flyway, interestingly, only has, was it six different commands, seven different commands? There's very, very few actual commands that you issue to Flyway. Yes, again, they have switches, but, you know, you can very easily remember all of the commands passed to Flyway. Also, he says, now it is time for... Chris Kurzweil tries to remember all of the Flyway commands. I'm not going to play that game because I definitely miss some off. Um, what I did want to say on that, though, was... Um, oh, what did I want to say on that? You made me derail my train of thought. Excellent. I'm glad I did. I can't believe you're not going to play my game. No, of course I'm not. Oh, sad. Well, how about, uh, how about you tell us what, migra what types of migrations are available in Flyway then? That was what I was coming back to. So ah. three different types of migration script. Um, so you have your standard down script, your migrate, your migrate command that goes with that. Um, so you put your change script in, you name it in a way that makes sense. So that mm -hmm. Flyway uses Flyway uses script name to, to manage the changes and deliver them in the right order. Put them in a folder. You can use whatever folder structure you like. It doesn't matter. The file name is the thing that matters. So it'll pluck everything out from the given folder that you choose. Again, flexibility is pretty important here. Um, but that's not just everything. So we, we think about there being two use cases when it comes to delivering database changes. In general, there are the one-off one scripts that you run. And the other type are repeatable scripts. Mm -hmm. So Flyaway, we call them repeatable migration scripts. They are scripts that will execute every time you run a migrate command. And there's really two different use cases for those. One is... Mm. They don't run every time you run the migrate command, only when they're checksum changes. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. There we go. Aha. Yeah. So there's yep. two, two use cases for that. I thought there was an option to run it every time. Uh, there might be an option to run it every time. Because you can use it so as, many. <laughs> but you can use it as pre and post scripts, um, as we were kind of used to thinking of pre and post scripts. Oh, like callbacks. Ex exactly, yeah. Mm. Uh, the second is, of course, Things like store procedures, functions, views, or just procedures if we're... Programmable objects, right? Yeah. Those things um, are perfect for the repeatable migrations. They only mm. get executed when they change. So you can put your logic in so that you're going to basically replace the, the, the object there when you need to. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say something about ingenious simplicity, but... I don't know if you're done with this subject yet. Shameless plug. Well, no, I think you're, um, you're absolutely bang on. It's uh, the three different types of migrations definitely have their, their place in the world. We haven't um, said the third one yet, by the way. We said the first two. Oh. Wow. Yeah, so no, I, I, I will leave you to, to mention the third <laughs> one before, so, before I start talking about commands again. So we have the migrate command that will run the migration scripts, but you mm. also then have the undo command. And the undo command will run any up scripts. And there's uh, it's quite a refreshing way of thinking about um, running change script management, I guess, with migration it's rollbacks. Scripts. Database yeah. rollbacks are one of the hardest things in the world to do. I mean, 
you know, apart from climbing Mount Everest. Ooh, well, there's lots of people who have done that, but how many people have tried to roll back database migrations? Let how many people you. have tried to do both? That would be a fun If you've rolled back Venn a database diagram. migration and been to the summit of Everest, let, let us know. Us know. <laughs> so, yeah, but it's quite simple. Like The way Flyway does it is simply say, here's your upscript, here's your downscript. So tell me what both of those are and I'll execute them in order. And then you go up and down, like you go up and down the ladder. Mm. Makes sense, right? Absolutely. So we've got version migrations and they are appended with this kind of um, the naming principle of V for versions naturally. Yeah. And then you include the version number and the num that number can be in pretty much, you know, most formats, right? It could be V1 or it could be v1.1 or v1.1.0.1, however you do that. And, and you can actually organize your various migrations. As, as long as they're in that format, you can also organize them into semantic version folders within the folder structure of Flyway because it will recursively scan every folder and basically build up an idea of what migrations it has available anyway. And... Then you've got the undo migrations, which unsurprisingly have the U prefix. So if we have versioned migration 1.1 that adds the table cars, then we would have the undo migration U 1.1 relating to that version migration that drops that table. But the point is you get to specify the steps. If you're contributing scripts V1 through three, and you specify the undo scripts, U1 through three, you know that if anything goes wrong with that deployment and people need to roll back the database to a particular point, they can undo all, all of those version migrations in a safe way because that is how you have chosen that they should be undone. That's how you've written it as opposed to relying on some kind of technology to make a guess for us and dropping an entire table. <laughs> yeah, that's always fun. Crash and burn, baby. Crash and burn. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, all right. So the commands. Do you know the commands off the top of your head? I think I do. All right. So we've said two. We've said migrate. We've said undo. What? Yes. Other? So you can you can issue flyway migrate and flyway undo to literally move up, move down, and that's yep. why it's really handy in a development environment specifically because devs can go forward and back as much as they like. You've also got the, the most. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you've also got the most basic command as well, which I think is the um, flyway info. So flyway info basically lets you know, it, it checks the schema history table at the target to see what's been run against the run against the target. And then you've got the flyway uh, and then the flyway repo locally. So the, the basically the location it's scanning for migrations and it's basically saying, hey, I've got these migrations, these have been run against the target, these haven't, these are undoable, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Literally, info gives you the information. Yeah. Uh, you've got uh, Flyway Validate, mm -hmm. which um, effectively checks the migrations that you've got locally. And it um, each whenever you run a Flyway Migrate, that validates first as well and actually checks that the migrations you have locally match the ones that have been run against the target so if someone has changed a file for instance if we migrated v2 and then someone's gone in and altered the script then that will fail because it changes the checksum and the the table at the target keeps track of the migrations that have been run the checksum when it was run the name etc so if you go to try and run something that someone's changed, it's like, oh, hang on a second. This could result in unexpected consequences. So, mm. but if you've just gone in and added a, a comment, for instance, well, that will change the checksum, but it won't change what's been run against the target. It's just a comment for documentation purposes. So, so that's why you would need the next one, the next command, go on. flyway repair. Hey. which will literally repair the flyway schema history table in line with the local um, value. So it just updates the target table and says, no, no, this is fine. Here's the new checksum, basically. Cool. So you've so got two left. Flyway info, yeah. flyway migrate, flyway undo, yeah. flyway validate, flyway yeah. repair. Yeah. 
you can get it. Oh dear. <laughs> you have a list in front of you. Have you pulled the list up? I have. What happens if you validate something and someone's gone wrong? How do you fix that? No, oh, that was repair. Oh. Sorry, that's not what I meant. Yeah, you, you have gone through that already. All right, what happens if you want to start again? Oh, oh no, I remember them now. Okay, so Flyway Clean. Yeah. Flyway Clean will drop every schema object, leaving you with an empty database. Literally clean. And it cleans. It does a really good job of cleaning. Uh, empty schema. Yeah, exactly. Completely empty schema. And that's really good for, as we say, starting again. And don't worry, I can imagine some of you out there thinking, uh, drop every object in the database. No, thank you. Not against production. Fortunately, you can disable clean against later stage environments using your comp file. I already told hey. you, you can do everything with that comp file. <laughs> and then if you try and migrate against a schema that exists already that hasn't had flyway run against it before naturally there will be objects that already exist on that database so what you do is you can run a flyway baseline command the final command uh, which will literally create a point at which it says okay I'm going to create the schema history table and where appropriate I'm going to mark the first the v V1 migration, as it were, the base version as the flyaway baseline version. And there's a specific naming convention for that, but it would effectively create that starting point and say, okay, everything from now, we're good to go. Yeah. You got them. Yay! Huzzah! <laughs> Only a little prompt. Yes. I, I'm so embarrassed that I forgot about clean, like the most wonderful command that I love to demonstrate, and I forgot about it. That's the one that you'd have to show off. Well, maybe it's because Drop I'm not that clean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So flyaway, that is like probably the worst elevator pitch I've ever heard in terms of quickly describe what flyaway is. Mm. But that pretty much is a big brain dump from the two of us on, on what it is. Yeah, what, and it's, what, what it's a great tool. What could people do, Chris, if they really wanted to find out more about Flyway? Well, if you wanted to find out more about Flyway, then I would definitely recommend going to the Flyway website, which is flywaydb.org. That's F-L-Y-W-A-Y-D-B.org. Mm -hmm. And that will take you on to the Flyway main site. And fortunately, there's a ton of different options there for you to learn more about it to download it unzip it get started remember it's open source software so if you want to get started with the community edition that is absolutely free grab it we don't mind do what you like um, and you can join the flyway community realistically i would say that your best shot at hearing the most amazing things uh, that we have coming up with flyway is to sign up for the flyway newsletter because then you'll get everything you need from there so if you just go to the flyway website you'll be able to sign up for the flyway newsletter uh, and you'll be able to hear everything that we're doing and you know if you were already on the newsletter you would have found out that on the 1st of september we announced the flyway 7 beta and just to give you an idea of uh you know what you can do with this beta version well it comes with a whole host of new features like the ability to cherry pick which migrations get run against target environments, the ability to run arbitrary scripts during flyway migrations. So PowerShell, bash, command scripts, Python files, etc. as you go. Um, there's Amazon S3 bucket and Google Cloud support. Uh, JDBC properties in clients and even support for new databases uh, like Azure Synapse. So there's a ton of new cool things coming out. Uh, Azure Synapse doesn't really, uh, doesn't really count as a database, I suppose, but uh, in itself, I don't know if it does count as a database, but um, you know, Synapse. So uh, there's a ton of different options in there as well. Well, I mean, Synapse is what the formerly data warehouse. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But there you go. So there's a ton of different options available in there for you. And the best way to stay up to date is, of course, 
to go and add yourself to the Flyway newsletter. So do us a favor, go and sign up and, uh, and have a play. See what and you think. It, if you've got a, a uh, let's say you, you're looking to implement something like Flyway and you're, you're not sure about, say, taking on an open source license, Mm. maybe you want to make sure that there is uh, a dedicated support channel for you. What options do you have, Chris? Well, I don't know. Well, fortunately, so we, we've recently uh, acquired Flyway, and as part of that, we've decided to essentially take the, uh, the Apache license and offer a commercial license on top of that. Yeah, So so take on, uh, basically take on Flyway and add that good old fashioned Redgate support yes. capability to it. Yes. Our support is absolutely incredible. Like we get so much great feedback about them. So now the, the combination of those two things, you know, there's, there's a few bells and whistles that are reserved for the pay tier as well. Uh, most notably undo and dry runs, which we haven't mentioned. No, this is true, the, the dry runs, and we didn't even talk that much about callbacks, but there's so much you can do with Flyway, it's crazy. And um, yes, there are lots of things you can do with the paid tier, but like we say, you know, it uh, depends what you're looking for. Indeed. So, Chris, I think that uh, leads us on quite nicely to our favorite, well, not our favorite segment, no, not when we've been talking about Flyway, <laughs> but it leads us on to the news the news i actually saw a, an asmr version of um of star wars the other day it was like asmr uh obi-wan kenobi and general grievous and it was like hello there general kenobi it's like oh that's... i want to ask why but i've already learned not to question your googling habits. i wouldn't i wouldn't yeah it's uh, not wise could you imagine asmr dbl here to talk to you about flyway mm. and data breaches <laughs> it's so true though it's so true so chris uh do you have a data breach for us i don't actually you told oh. me you had a big data breach to talk about so i thought I actually, i'd let you take the spotlight i actually do have quite a good data breach for us uh this time round, actually so uh there is uh it, it, really interesting story that I only saw when um, when Troy Hunt tweeted it uh, tweeted it on uh, on Twitter, and this was on August twenty seventh. Uh, he tweeted a uh, Nigerian bank data breach, and it was the um, it was Unity Bank in Nigeria, and it's a really interesting data breach because um, it was kind of reported at the time and just didn't seem like much was going on. It didn't seem like much was happening. So it was effectively a .sql file. So a dump from a database and uh, it contained the PII of 53,000 individuals. Wow. And when it was Literally initially- Literally a SQL script, just- Yeah, just the, the insert values, I think. And uh, oh, the, interesting, the interesting thing about it though, is that it was reported on August 25th by uh, a, a, a kind of a bank security specific Twitter account, un unsurprisingly called bank underscore security. And uh, <laughs> I know, and they tweeted about this, this breach. And it actually turns out um, since then, towards the end of uh, August, it turns out that the, the, the breach was actually of about 53,000 job seekers on Unity Bank's job portal. Oh. And um, yeah, no one can seem to, from all of the information I found on it, no one can seem to figure out what, what the data really was for. Some people seem to say that it was for, um, it was for, I don't know, reporting purposes. Some people said it was um, some past enrollment exercise. But naturally, it's sensitive information. It's 53,000 people's sensitive information. And it included people's names, house addresses, emails, phone numbers, the dates of birth. And naturally, this could be a bit of a problem. But yeah, just a bit. 
the the interesting thing about it is that you know there is uh, there is a, a lawsuit being raised against them at the moment. Um, it was filed on the twenty eighth of August. That didn't take long. No, no. Well, I mean, fifty three thousand people's data just got breached in uh, by by Unity Bank. But the, the interesting thing is, it wasn't just it wasn't just Unity Bank that have had a breach. There was also um, within the same kind of area. There was also a couple of other breaches within um, within Nigeria, and there was uh, a, a breach of Access Bank as well, supposedly on the on August thirty first, um, and then also a breach at. Um, Team Apt, which was a, it's a Nigerian fintech company. And it's basically, uh, basically, I don't know, they've all been playing down these breaches. The, the most interesting thing about this is that when you look at the statement on the websites of the, of the banks of, and companies affected, and I'll stick with uh, Unity Bank for this one. But when you look at Unity Bank's uh, statement, they basically, so here's what the statement reads. So there's no doubt in our minds that the, the data came from Unity Bank. The uh, Nigeria has a data protection uh, piece of, a piece of data protection legislation from 2019. And naturally it's in breach of that. So a suit yep. has been raised against them. So right. everyone's under no doubts that this information came from Unity Bank. And right. The statement that the statement reads, tell me if you think anything's wrong with this. Our attention has been drawn to social media reports purporting a data breach of our systems. For the avoidance of doubt, Unity Bank wishes to reassure all customers that we take the protection of their personal information very seriously in accordance with data protection legislation. The bank hereby reassures its customers and the public at large of the integrity of its systems, controls of which are continually enhanced in line with best practices to forestall attempts at compromising confidential data. We also implore all our esteemed customers and the public to be vigilant and not succumb to false and suspicious emails, text, calls, messages devised to mislead them into disclosing their personal details. So avoid the question a little bit. So avoid the question. Oh, our systems, <laughs> by the way, our systems are great. And oh, customers, you should all be very, very careful. So what they're saying is that it wasn't customer information. It was other information. So it's fine. Well, they didn't even say that. They didn't even, they didn't even say whether or not it happened, just that their attention has been drawn to purported news of their systems being breached and they haven't said what they are planning on doing about it they haven't said if it's true if it's false they they didn't say no this is fake statements it's really interesting statements drafted by lawyers for 500 uh, please chris <laughs> ding <laughs> yeah absolutely so yeah i just thought that was a really weird a really weird occurrence that i'm not really sure what's what's going on there if i'm honest but it's also uh, I thought interesting, it interesting to, to see is see like a, a sequel based <laughs> a sequel based um data breach we don't really get many of those ironically we've given our friend uh, our, our good old friend elastic search a break for a month <laughs> uh okay so other things we should mention in the news i guess sequel bits Yes, absolutely. So SQL Bits, the, uh, the biggest data show is going to be happening. Um, oh, gosh, I should know this. Uh, but it's happening from the hang on, Saturday, the third, Wednesday, Tuesday. It's basically on, end me... of September and then the first few days of October. So it's happening from the 29th of September to the 3rd of October. I had to click on it to double check because in my head I was thinking the 1st to the 3rd of October. And I thought, no, that's way too short. Um, yeah. Of course, naturally, if you don't know about SQL Bits already, SQL Bits is Europe's greatest data conference. It's, well, I mean, it, it, it is chocked full of incredible speakers and sessions, and it really is just an incredible event. 
And it was supposed to happen, <clears throat> they've got training sessions and they've got conference sessions and they do have tickets still available for a short time. So if you're listening to this, go and grab some if you don't already. Uh, but the interesting thing is they do training sessions and conference sessions, they have a virtual exhibition. Um, and it was because this was supposed to be earlier in the year this year, but unfortunately, uh, they weren't able to run it because of obvious reasons. So it's gone completely online, a completely virtual conference, and uh, you can register now. Cool. And there are some speakers there that we think you should pay attention to. Absolutely. So we'll recommend a couple of sessions for you. Um, I should also point out that, number one, Chris and I will both be there uh, as part of the exhibition um, representing Redgate software. So Chris, what day are you going to be there? I'm there on the Thursday, which I believe is the first. On the Thursday, and I will be there on Saturday the 3rd. And, um, you know, we should point out that this list is in no way uh, exhaustive. There are a billion and one different sessions at SQL Bits. So if you're doing a session, if you're listening and you're doing a session, and we don't mention your session, we're sorry, you're probably doing an amazing job. But um, I've just pulled out a few really interesting ones that I think people should definitely go and watch um, if, if they get a chance or watch back if they get the chance. Come on, hit me. So my three, realistically, and I tried to pull up um, Hamish Watson's, uh, Hamish Watson's uh, particular one on um, why you can't achieve DevOps without the culture. Um, unfortunately, the website wasn't letting me open it. So I'm, I'm hoping that it's still going ahead. But uh, the, the three that I've picked out just to, to call attention to, um, you've got what SQL Server DBAs need to know about Docker containers. I think that'll be exceedingly informative and insightful. Um, and that's uh, Edwin Sarmiento. Um, so go and check out Edwin's session if you haven't already. Um, another one is from our good friend, the wonderful, the beardy, the DBA tools loving Rob Sewell. And he's doing a SQL notebooks in Azure, Azure Data Studio for the DBA. So if you're interested in how you can use SQL notebooks um, installed in Azure Data Studio and using diagnostic queries, then that session is 100% must see, it's absolutely. And Rob is just such an incredible person and presenter that I can't recommend it enough. Um, and then also there are some fabulous sessions. Uh, I couldn't decide on three, so I've actually gone with four. So uh. there's two more sessions, I'm sorry. Two more sessions I'd recommend. The first of these is um, DevOps 101 for data folks. Uh, and that's uh, Alex Yates. So that's a session that you should definitely check out. I think that's on the Friday. Um, and also on the Friday is the new normal for database DevOps. And that's uh, Kendra Little. So she's going to be uh, speaking about database DevOps as well. And yeah, those four sessions just sound like worthwhile paying the ticket fee anyway. But it's not just those four sessions, it's so many more, like Chris. Uh, so we also have some Redgate personnel presenting, right? And I'm sure the advocates are there for the specifically two sessions delivered by Grant, I think are going to be good because Grant's always worth listening to. Oh, 100%. Uh, what a personality. So he's got a session also uh, helping DBA succeed with DevOps. So that's worth checking out. And another session around um, helping you out or helping you get to grips with SQL injection. So how it mm. works, how to stop it. And then finally, I'd be remiss, remiss at not mentioning that there is a certain somebody on this podcast who has his own session. Ooh, fancy pants. So on the Saturday, I believe that you're going to be delivering a session, are you not? I am indeed, yes. I'm going to be delivering a session. Um, I can't remember what it's called. What is it? Stop that, <laughs> what, uh, what compliance means for development. And effectively, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, the different, some of the different regulations uh, that are out there in the world and some of the commonalities between them, why they are very, very similar, um, you know, what, what 
what can help you build a defensible compliance position as a DBA, as a developer, as a data professional, um, despite whatever regulations you are, uh, whatever regulations you're trying to be compliant with. So that's on the Saturday. It's at about 11.30, I think. So definitely go and check that out. Don't, as Chris just did, spill beer all over your mouse. Yeah, that was, that, in case you're wondering what that noise and strangled cry was, that was me lamenting m what might be the death of my poor mouse. It's working fine. I'm a For little now. bit concerned, though. Yes, and apologies, apologies to John there for, for you wasting some of the hard made beer, but it looks delicious. Um, but yeah, so I think, the, I think the summary there is, hey, go and check out SQL Bits. It's going to be absolutely incredible. We can't wait. And uh, don't naturally, pour Chris, beer all over your mouse. Yeah, don't pour beer all over your mouse. So I think that's pretty much all we've got time for today. So we've been through quite a lot of information in this particular one. It's been an absolute smorgasbord of all you wonderful ever information. You needed to know about Flyaway and several things you didn't. Exactly. Uh, so just to recap, then go and check out flywaydb.org and sign up for the Flyaway newsletter. Uh, make sure you check out SQL Bits, some incredible sessions from some incredible speakers. Uh, feel free to get in touch with myself and Chris as well, dbl at, uh, dbl at red-gate.com or at plant-based sql on Twitter or at Kurzweil Chris on Twitter. And naturally, we'll just be so happy to hear from you. We really do love it when people reach out. We love it even more when people send us beer. So thank you so much, Stephen. And of course, Stephen's friend, John, for the homebrew. It's been absolutely delightful cheers all and cheers, cheers chris oh i can cheers chris something. hang on hang on beautiful cheers